I'll be talking about the FastMath uh, project. This is a large multi-institutional project that has been funded by the Department of Energy uh, for the last four years. So uh, for those who aren't as familiar with numerical methods and software, I'm going to spend the first five or seven minutes giving you just a very, very high-level overview of what it means to uh, discretize uh, a model problem. There are lots of steps and components involved in the discretization and the solution of physical systems with numerical methods. And you know the basic steps of the process are that the first thing you need to do is develop a mathematical model of what it is you're trying to solve. And so when you see climate simulations, you know that's all described by a set of partial differential equations or um, ODEs. And those things are often very complicated and they don't have analytic solutions. And so the very first thing that we tend to do is we say, OK, we've got a physical model. We've got some domain that that's on. Let's break that domain up into smaller pieces. Uh, we do that through a process called um, you know, meshing or, or gridding uh, to, to break that into something that's much simpler to deal with, like a square or a triangle or a tetrahedron, some very simple shape. And then we also uh, represent the continuous PDE model with a discrete representation of that. And I'll give you a very simple example next of what that means. So then you, um, once you have that discrete representation, it'll result in a very large system of equations. So I'm giving you the overview now, and then we'll go through an example in a minute. You'll solve that, that system of, of, of equations. Perhaps uh, you didn't get the mesh quite right the first time, and so you want to do some adaptive mesh refinement to focus more grid points where the solution is changing rapidly or where you have more error. And then, you know, iterate and loop on that process until you're happy with the answer that you've got. And so these steps require lots and lots of different uh, components or software packages ranging from things like CAD models, if you have a complex engineering part, uh, grid generation, high order discretization, time integration, linear, nonlinear solution techniques, sometimes eigensolver techniques, mesh refinement, lots of different coupling strategies. If you've got multiple physics that you want to blend together, it can be really quite a complex process. Uh, but we're, we're first going to start with what everybody learns in numerical analysis 101. So for those, and this is where those who know a lot of applied math, you can read your email. <laughs> so, but for those who, who don't, let's start with a really simple example so you have a sense of what we're talking about today. So consider you have a, just a one-dimensional rod, and you put one end of that rod in a hot water bath, and you put an, the other end of that rod in a cold water bath. So eventually, over time, what's going to happen is that rod will equal, you know, equilibrate to, to where you have, you know, this end of the rod will be the same temperature as the hot water, this end of the rod will be the same temperature as the cold water, and it'll be, you know, a, a gradient in between that, between those two temperatures, right? So everybody understands that intuitively. But what does that mean from a mathematics perspective? Well, it turns out you can model that with a very simple partial differential equation called a Laplacian, which is represented by this, you know, delta squared t equals zero. And then you have boundary conditions. You know, maybe it's 180 degrees in the hot water bath and zero degrees in the cold water bath. So that's your continuous model. That's your domain. And the very first thing you want to do is approximate that continuous model with some discrete model. So what I'm going to do is break my domain up into something that's very, very, very simple, like an array of points on the, on the model. And then I'm going to represent that continuous PDE, that Laplacian, with a discrete representation. And so one of the things I can think about is that every grid point is going to be uh, the average of the two grid points around that, right? So that's a finite difference, a centered finite difference approximation of this Laplacian, which is represented uh, here, where now instead of having a continuous variable t, I have discrete points, t sub i, t sub i plus 1, et cetera. And I still have boundary conditions. At t0, I have 180 degrees. And at the very last point, t sub n, I have 0 degrees. OK, so now I've got a whole bunch of unknowns, my t sub i's. I have two boundary conditions. And the way I solve that is I go ahead and I set it up into a matrix. And so a matrix is just a big linear um, a, you know, array of numbers. Here you can see those you know, 2 minus 1, that for every t sub i that I have, I have that you know, it's um, the average of the points around it. I set my boundary conditions up on the right-hand side of the equation. And now all I have to do is solve this linear system of equation, and I'll know the answer at each of the t sub i 
uh, discretization points. And then you're, you visualize the results, you analyze them, and you're done. It's all very exciting. So that's numerical analysis at the very highest level <laughs> with the simplest example. And of course, it's much, much more complicated than that for the problems that we're trying to tackle in reality. And so different discretization strategies exist for different things that you want to do. So for example, if you have um, different needs, if you have maybe a simpler geometry like the unit cube or something, perhaps you can use a Cartesian grid and do block structured AMR. And so that's very, very efficient because you can represent that with just IJK not notation. But maybe you need a little bit more flexibility. Maybe your domain is extremely complex. And in that case, you might want to use an unstructured grid, something with triangles or tetrahedra or hexahedra, where it's much more expensive to store that representation because you don't know a priori where the grid points are and they aren't laid out in a logical rectangular grid, but you do have a lot more flexibility in terms of how you're handling the, the domain. So most problems that we deal with are, are time dependent. Uh, they're also nonlinear, which means we need um, much higher algorithmic uh, kinds of solvers than just solving a big matrix. So there's much more involved in, in solving the linear and nonlinear systems. Increasingly, uh, we're interested in combining difficult, different physical processes together. So I mentioned earlier the notion of, of climate modeling. And in that case, for example, you want to couple what's going on in the ocean with what's going on in the atmosphere, with what's going on with the vegetation, with what's going on in clouds, with what's going on with the sea ice. And right, so you have a very complex interconnected system, each of which is potentially represented by different sets of PDEs with different domains, different parts of the domain that they belong to. And you have to figure out how to couple those together in ways that are accurate and stable. And, and also, um, if you're thinking more about maybe engineering problems like designing an, an uh, airplane wing, right, or a new aircraft, often these things require much, um, an, an additional loop around the whole solution of the PDE process. For example, I want to optimize the shape of the wing to minimize the drag. And so you bring in things like optimization, or if you need to understand, okay, I've discretized my equations, I've modeled my continuous physical processes with some model. What's the uncertainty that I've introduced? What's the error that I've introduced in that process? And so there are some higher level techniques like optimization and uncertainty quantification that you also bring into, into the mix. And as these problem sizes grow, so do the corresponding discrete systems. And so typically, we're solving problems with millions and billions of unknowns. And so that simple 2 minus 1 matrix I showed you, imagine that you know, much, much bigger than, you know, the size of this building, right? You know, billions and billions of unknown. Uh, and, and they're also much more complicated. That was a very simple tridiagonal system. Uh, these systems can get much more complex in terms of the non-zero structure and require lots of different kinds of algorithms to solve them. It's often the most expensive step in the solution process uh, and can take anywhere from 50, 60, even 90% of the total solution time just to solve those linear systems. So there's different methods that you can use um, that we'll be talking about throughout the course of the next couple of days. There are direct methods, uh, such as Gaussian elimination is a, you know, a simple one, but those become much more complex as the systems get bigger. And then iterative methods, for example, for those who are familiar, conjugate gradient or other Krylov-based solvers, uh, GM res. And, and in, we'll talk about both of those throughout the course of the couple of days. And a lot of these software tools for the meshing, you know, both structured and unstructured grids, for adaptive mesh refinement, for the solution of linear systems, both direct and iterative, those are encapsulated in software libraries that are being developed as, at the DOE, at the Department of Energy, and are a part of the Fast Math Institute. And of course, things are getting increasingly more challenging as the machines get more complex. I know you guys have focused for the first part of the week on things like programming models and looking at the different systems. And right now, we're going through a pretty fundamental shift and what the architectures are looking like. So they're much more heterogeneous. There's gonna be much more uh, fault tolerance that we need to build in potentially. And as, as you increase the number of cores, the th kinds of things that you have to worry about when you're developing numerical methods or applications start to change and start to think about, you know, what does it mean to really debug something when you have a million, million processes? Printf is no longer 
although it's still often used, um, as friendly a tool as it was when you had, say, one processor or two processors. And as, as you go up, you know, load balancing is increasingly important, uh, particularly when you start to have heterogeneity in your processors as well as in your workload, you know, the solution or the application that you're trying to solve. Um, now we're getting to the point, of course, where we have much more in the way of accelerators and different kinds of processors that we're trying to to um, address. And as we move toward exascale, increasingly power is going to become a constraint. And so what are, what are the kinds of operations that take more power? Well, that's data movement. That takes much more power than a flop. And so suddenly, you have to start thinking about your algorithms from the perspective of, I've got to minimize my power consumption. I've got to minimize my data movement. And so um, all of that leads to a lot of complexity facing application scientists in terms of reliability, I, we talked about accuracy, stability, when you're coupling lots of different physical processes together. Software complexity, both dealing with the complexity of the numerical methods that you're, that you're trying to solve, but also with the computer architectures that, that we have as well. And then performance. So uh, one of the panels that we're going to have uh, this afternoon is on performance portability and the kinds of things that we've done to try and achieve good performance for different kinds of architectures as the architectures grow and, and shift under our feet. And so, so that's what the Fast Math Institute is really tackling. So we're really focusing on the development and use of numerical methods and algorithms um, for use within the, in the Department of Energy complex for different applications within, within uh, the DOE, such as um, sea ice modeling, land sea ice coupling and modeling, fusion energy sciences, um, modeling uh, big accelerators, for example. Lots of different applications to which these tools can be applied. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about fast math proper and give you an introduction to what you'll be hearing about over the next day and a half. So uh, fast math itself compass, encompasses three broad topical areas. So we talked about you know the first part of the problem setup is tools for problem discretization. So we have both structured and unstructured grid techniques involved. We're looking at a lot of high order methods, adaptive mesh refinement, complex geometry, uh, time integration techniques, uh, and then the solution of those big linear and nonlinear systems. So both iterative and direct uh, systems of equations, nonlinear systems, and then eigensystems as well. And then uh, one of the advantages that we have as part of the Fast Math Institute, because we are large, because we bring all of these technologies together into one center, is we can start to look at what does it mean to have um, high-level integrated solution technologies. So where can we get additional efficiencies by considering the needs of the linear solvers when we're doing adaptive mesh refinement and vice versa? Yes. Are you working strictly with implicit solvers, or are you also doing research into sort of like time-stepping methods for explicit schemes? Uh, we have both. So, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about each of those three areas, um, just to give you a high-level introduction. The first is structured grid capabilities. Now, structured grids have been around for a long time, since the 80s, when they were introduced by Berger, Colella, et cetera, um, in terms of adaptive mesh refinement. So we're particularly focused on high order adaptive mesh refinement in that context. Uh, like I said, it's been around for a long time, but there's still a lot of research that needs to be done in terms of how do you deal with the interfaces between a coarse grid and a fine grid? How do you do that in, in, for different kinds of problem techniques that are, or problem regimes that are stable and accurate? And there are, there are variations on that theme. So, you know, you can have structured grids, which are just maybe big blocks of Cartesian grids, but you can also think about mapped multi-block grids where perhaps you have a logically rectangular grid, but you've mapped it or, or you know, curved it a little bit to fit a part of your domain. And then you can think about stitching various of those together. And again, questions come up. At the interface between different mapped grids, how do you maintain high order accuracy, for example, as you go from one grid to another? Embedded boundary methods in this particular case you have a very complex domain and you say, I'm just going to lay down a Cartesian grid on top of that and I'm going to cut out all the cells around the boundary. Well, that's great on the interior. You just have a logically structured grid. It's very efficient. It's very fast and, and um, very nice. But now on the boundary, you have all of these special case cells where you've maybe chopped it off. And, you know, so it's one particular shape here. Maybe you've got a tiny little cell over here in the corner. And that can infect things like your time stepping. So if you've got little tiny 
grid cells, all of a sudden you have to take really tiny little steps to accommodate that. How do you get around that and not have to do that everywhere? And then particle-based methods. So that's where you, you bring um, particles into the simulation and you allow them to flow through the grid because they uh, represent different kinds of physics. So we use that a lot, for example, when modeling fusion applications with Vlasov equations. And so then you have questions of how do you exchange information between the particles, which have certain kinds of energy and are bringing certain things into the physical system, with the continuous part of the PDE? And how do you do that accurately and efficiently? So those are the kinds of things that we think about for structured grids. On the unstructured grid side, um, one of the things that you really have to worry about is the mesh generation phase. So it's not as easy as when you just uh, have a Cartesian grid. Uh, so you have to come up with techniques that uh, align well with the geometry, produce high quality meshes, perhaps align well with the physics that you're trying to, to model uh, in order to get the most accurate results. Uh, when you're doing adaptive mesh refinement, both with structured and unstructured grids, uh, dynamic load balancing is, is a very important part of the equation in terms of getting good performance across all the processors. So if you've got one processor that's heavily loaded and everybody else is just sitting idle and you've got a million processors, you're wasting millions of dollars of, fun, of, well, of money, actually, because time is money on these computers. Uh, so mesh adaptation and quality control. In this particular case, we have um, perhaps we want to have long, skinny elements in a boundary layer. And so how do we figure out exactly what those elements should look like to achieve the maximum accuracy for a given number of element count, right? Uh, and then, of course, parallel performance and then and the architecture aware implementations. On the, on the linear system side, uh, as I said, we're, we're looking at both uh, direct and iterative sol solvers, so we have work with conjugate gradient methods, GMRES methods, just the whole uh, suite of tools there. Nonlinear system solution using various different kinds of acceleration techniques, such as uh, Anderson fixed point and other globalized type methods. Uh, Eigen solvers, we're looking at symmetric problems, non-symmetric problems, problems where you need to extract just one or two eigenvalues from a large system, problems where you need to extract a number of eigenvalues or, or eigenpairs from a, from a large system. And you need different kinds of solvers to address those different needs that you may have. And then in terms of the integration of these technologies together, there are lots of different things that we're looking at. I've already mentioned the, the idea that we need strong mesh and solver coupling together in order to achieve the most efficient solution uh, overall. But also, you might need to think about how are you going to couple different meshes together and do mesh-to-mesh -mesh coupling for different multi-physics type applications. That's increasingly important as we go forward. Uh, uh, one of the interesting things that has come up throughout the years is that there are applications that have used unstructured grids, and it's the heart and soul, right? The discretization techniques are the heart and soul of the applications. And so we, when you want to introduce new tools like adaptive mesh refinement, which can be a lot of work to implement uh, efficiently, and so they want to use libraries, but they don't want to give up control. And so how do you integrate um, tools and libraries like unstructured adaptive mesh refinement into the heart and soul of an application and do that efficiently. So these are the kinds of things that, that we've been thinking about. Uh, we're going to, um, you know, all of these tools are encompassed in a lot of different libraries. You'll hear about many of these libraries over the next day and a half or so. Um, so, so I won't go through all of them, but like I said, you'll hear about structured grids, unstructured grids, linear and nonlinear solvers. And then our, most of our research, the, you know, you're here for extreme scale computing. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, most of the research that we're doing is really focused on improving the performance of our libraries, both inter-node, so across nodes, massive concurrency, right? How do, how do you achieve massive concurrency? And then intra-node, so the memory hierarchies are getting deeper and deeper. And so how do you uh, create techniques that will, that will handle that? And so there are lots of different things that we're, we're looking at to address these challenges, including things like reducing communication. So if you have, for example, an algebraic multigrid technique, and you'll hear about algebraic multigrid uh, later today, uh, there's a, a, a product of three matrices, a Glurkin operator in there, that when you multiply those matrices together, you get a lot of fill. And so you create a lot of non-zeros. That creates a lot of communication. So what are the different strategies that you can use to reduce that communication cost? Uh, overall. So you can think about just eliminating some of the entries of that matrix. Uh, 
right, and reducing communication that way. You can think about different strategies where you use an additive approach rather than a multiplicative approach, which might impact the convergence of the method, but overall speed up the solution process because you're doing a lot less communication, you have less overhead. So, so there's lots of different things that we talk about to reduce communication. I, I suspect Jim will talk a fair amount about that in his talk, which is coming up next. Uh, increasing concurrency. So there's lots of things that we're doing uh, to increase concurrency. There are new algorithms that you can look at, for example, an eigensystem solution, um, or utilizing, for example, uh, architectures with millions of nodes uh, to, to look at extreme scale uh, demonstrations. So you'll hear a little bit about unstructured gridding techniques this afternoon, and they'll talk a little bit about the extreme scaling that we've done uh, in that case. We've made lots of impact on applications, and so um, I won't bore you with the details, but you're more, I'm more than happy to talk to you about those things, or the team is more than happy to talk to you about those things as we, as we go along. And we've also really been trying to tackle the software challenges. And so I don't know how many of you have tried to use lots of different packages together to solve a problem. You know that that can be a really tangled ball of yarn, right? And so I love this picture of this cat trying to deal with his software issues. Um, so we have been working hard within the Fast Math Institute to try and address some of those challenge by, by creating much more uniform look and feel to the build and configure process for the applied math packages that we support. Um, looking at inconsistent or missing configuration information, those kinds of things to help ease that burden. So Fast Math, as I mentioned, is a, is a large uh, team, you know, experts from four laboratories and six different universities, and so, and so our goals for today and tomorrow are basically to provide you with a basic understanding of a variety of the different applied math tools that, that we have um, that are available to you. They're all open source, they're all available for use, um, and, and all of the range of technologies that I've talked about, structured grids, unstructured grids, and the various solution strategies. Um, provide you an overview of, of those tools and how uh, they perform on high performance computing architectures, and then practice using one or more of the software tools in our hands on sessions. So, this is the management team of the Fast Math Institute. Um, I think, let's see, Barry Smith will be giving a talk a little bit later this morning. Mark Shepard will be giving a talk this afternoon, and of course, I'm, I'm here. <laughs>